Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is David Klaus. I'm the Consulting Project Director for the Wilson Center on the Hill uh, program. Uh, welcome uh, to this program, which is co-sponsored by the Wilson Center on the Hill program and the Wilson Center's Africa program. Uh, a brief introduction to the Wilson Center for those who are not familiar. Uh, Wilson Center was established by the U.S. Congress as a living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, uh, who was the only president to be both president and uh, a Ph.D. And in lieu of building, building some monument or some tall structure, uh, what, they, what they decided to do was uh, to create uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center, which hosts probably uh, approximately 130 to 140 scholars each year uh, doing work. Uh, we also have, in addition to the scholars, about uh, a fairly substantial set of programs in residence at the center, uh, including the Africa program, which is run uh, by former Congressman Howard Wolpe. Um, and the Wilson Center on the Hill program, which is one of the ways in which we try and take all of what goes on at the Woodrow Wilson Center and uh, bring that policy debate up uh, to the U.S. Congress uh, uh, for them to participate. Uh, let me call your attention to one uh, of the items that was on the handout uh, up front. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a postcard that says, do you want to be on the Wilson Center mailing list? And uh, if, you, if, you're, if you take that and check, you know, fill out the information and check the appropriate boxes, we promise we won't sell your name, we won't uh, make a profit off it, we don't ask for a social security number. Um, but if you check off the areas that you're interested in, uh, what we'll do is we will put you on the mailing list for both the electronic and the hard copy publications. And what you'll find is that on a fairly regular basis, uh, you will receive uh, just a, a whole host of, whether they're scholarly papers or uh, reports on dialogues or uh, reports on programs that have taken place, et cetera. Um, and that'll be, I think, uh, a wealth of information for you on the topics that are of interest to you. Uh, if you fill that out and just give it back to us, we'll save you 42 cents. Um, with that, um, uh, let me also announce that uh, we, have one, uh, we have one more uh, Wilson Center program scheduled uh, in the short-term future, and that is on uh, Tuesday, March 31st, uh, we'll have a program in which we're going to preview uh, the G20. Um, as all of you know or may know, uh, this is really, there's G20 meetings and then there's G20 meetings, and uh, we are at a point where the meeting of the world's uh, finance ministers and the sort of the and the question of how we are going to collectively tackle the uh, the financial challenges that we have uh, is really quite significant. Um, with that, let me now uh, introduce uh, uh, the moderator for the program today, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, that Ann Tutwiler agreed to do this. Um, uh, Ann. Uh, and all of you should have uh, brief bios, but let me say that one of the things that she listed that is not listed as prominently as I think it should be on that is that in her capacity as a program official at the uh, Hewlett, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Anne was one of the people who saw the potential for the Wilson Center on the Hill program, uh, and I am, uh, and we are, I think, should all be grateful to her uh, for her help in identifying it and providing the funding. Uh, for those of you who do not know, the Wilson Center on the Hill program is funded by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Uh, so with that, let me uh, thank you for coming and introduce Ann Tutwiler. Thanks, David, and thanks uh, to all of you for being here. It's quite gratifying, actually, to see such a good turnout for a discussion on uh, how the financial crisis that we're all certainly feeling is affecting Africa. I just want to make a couple of introductory remarks um, kind of to frame the discussion before we turn to our, our two speakers. Um, and I'm sure, looking at their bios, they're, they're, they're both um, going to be talking, I think, along, along these lines. Um, for those of you who, who aren't real familiar, Africa has been growing um, at quite a rapid clip for the past five or six years, due largely to um, some of the resource-based demand for oil and minerals and other um, commodities. And as, as a result of that, that growth and the projected demand that, that the African um, officials have seen coming out for the next uh, 15, 20 years based on demand projections in China and India, 
um, they have pulled together um, a, a growth strategy based on developing these resources and, and creating a more vibrant economy based on this, this growth in terms of um, minerals and agriculture, but that's very diversified. And for that kind of growth to take place in these sectors um, and to have it be healthy growth, Africa needs foreign investment, it needs trade, it needs remittances, and it needs foreign assistance. And as a result of the crisis that we're now in, all of those elements have taken a hit. And at the same time, commodity prices, which were quite high during the time of, of this growth, and, and of course last, last year when we had the food crisis, um, have also collapsed. And I think one of the messages during this time of, of crisis is that we, we need to continue laying the foundations for a return to economic growth in Africa. Um, it's all well and good for all of us to focus on, um, on foreign assistance and on um, alleviation of suffering and on health. But these are not the kinds of foreign assistance that actually lay the foundation for long-term growth, which Africa is going to need, so it can provide its own health care and can provide its own education. And this is where we ultimately want um, to s Africans want to see Africa, and we should want to see Africa. And I think it's important during this period of time, as as you all, as as staff up here um, holding the purse strings or, or at least uh, advising the people who ho hold the purse strings, that it's really important that we uh, remember that there are some fundamental strands of economic growth, um, such as um, building capacity for trade, uh, such as opening uh, markets around the world for African products, uh, loosening the rules of origin that uh, are so crazy uh, in some of our preference programs that can really help over the long term. Um, and I will leave you with, with one number. Um, the investment that most people estimate is required per year for Africa to really get its infrastructure up to, up to par is around, depending on whose numbers you take, 25 to 40 billion dollars. And as one uh, African president said, I think at this past week's uh, G20 meeting, just think of us like a small bank that you're saving in the United States. 25 to 40 billion dollars is a s small amount of money. And infrastructure and these other kinds of, of investments really will lay the foundation for the kind of long-term growth that I think we all want to see. So with that, I'm going to start with Catherine since she's um, not eating. <laughs> um, I know you all have the bios, so I, I won't um, say too much more than I think it's important to have someone here. Um, are you, you guys want to take a vote? <laughs> Oh, no. no, okay. Um, who has um, written about finance in emerging markets? Because again, this is one of the the challenges that's that has been with Africa before the current crisis, and um, is certainly uh, the key issue now. So Catherine is a fellow with the Woodrow Wilson Center, and uh, has been a professor at uh, Case Western University in the political science department. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for coming today to talk about this very important topic. What I thought I would do is start out with a little bit of kind of how I, I came about studying the continent of Africa with respect to its financial system, because I think it, it has a lot to say about how we're looking at the financial crisis specifically right now. When I was in graduate school, um, I had the opportunity to spend some time in New York City uh, doing research at the United Nations on the African group in UNCTAD. And at the time, there was a series of newspaper articles that appeared that dealt with the growing stock markets in Africa. Africa, it's all about stock markets now. 
And at the time, I was living with my sister who was working on an MBA and her friends who were from Africa. And, and all of the talk was about African stock markets. So I decided when I finished my dissertation to go in, and study one. In particular, I, I studied the one in Cote d'Ivoire. And um, when I started to study the, the market in Cote d'Ivoire, what I thought was interesting was that other people from the developing world and people I had come in contact with at the United Nations would say to me, well, what is it about Africa that, that is, is similar about Africa? And at this time, I had a hard time answering that question because it, it seemed as if middle-income African countries acted like middle-income countries and, and low-income countries didn't have stock markets. And it seemed like the media had, had kind of overblown this maybe a little bit. But the more I learned about it, the more I would argue that what I was finding out in Africa was very true in middle-income countries and, and, and later in our own country that, um, that maybe isn't represented in the literature. And that would just be that there's a high degree of politicization in how shares are issued on African stock markets. And so, um, so I thought that was something interesting, and then I decided to do a comparative study and compare um, all of the developing regions of the world, and that was the book I published. When the book was coming out, the same, the same set of discussions came out in, in with respect to what is it about developing world that's different from our own country, and again, privately, I had the same internal response. There's almost nothing that was in stock markets on, in the developing world that you can't say was going on on the New York Stock Exchange. It was just that what was going on in the New York Stock Exchange was a greater volume of shares, and there was more diversity of activity. And so I'm a little bit um, reluctant to try to separate out Africa now, given the, cr the financial crisis that has started here, because I would argue that, that there are some, some things that are very similar, and also that, um, that the political elements are, are, are not maybe as apparent in this country, but they're certainly evident in Africa. So anyway, what I argued with respect to all of these countries, but what I really thought is apparent in Africa that we should all think about, is that you can't really understand stock markets and bond markets in the aggregate, the way people in political science look at them. I think that what you really need to do is look within the firm. So you really need to look at firms and understand where they're getting their money from when they want to finance new investment. And here, Africa did actually have something in common because African countries generally only have a few big parastatals or a few big countries, that, or co excuse me, companies that are, that are financing trade. So they're obviously very um, heavily trade export um, firms. And usually, these firms have a history that is much longer than the regulation that precedes them. And I would point out that that's very similar to our own, our own um, industrial setup. But um, they have a structure that predates even the, the political state itself. So the firm is generally older than the African country that currently exists. So when we think about the crisis, what I think is important is to think about the individual firms that we're talking about and also to think very specifically about the individual countries. When I teach about Africa and, um, and the political economy, I'm fond of reminding students from the get-go that Africa is a continent and not a country, and we shouldn't make generalizations that are one size fits all about it because that's where we've gotten into so many problems in the past with um, some of the very well-intentioned aid programs that have come out of the Western world. So what I thought I'll do in the next few minutes is briefly sketch generally how the financial sector in Africa is responding to the crisis and then point out some of these very specific features that we should think about. So if we think about the sectors in general, what we're talking about in Africa with respect to the financial crisis is really a projection onto the future. For better or for worse, the immediate situation with respect to the crisis has not hit the core as much as it's hit middle-income countries and, and obviously the United States because African financial systems are simply not as integrated and not as developed as they are in, in China, certainly, but also in the core of the world's financial system. So in the 2007 subprime crisis, there was no subprime crisis or 2008 immediate banking crisis because the so-called toxic assets that you've all been hearing about so much on the news um, are not on the balance sheets of African banks. And derivative products are not for the most, uh, almost exclusively, I mean, or almost completely on balance sheets of African banks. 
So African financial systems are still dominated by the banking sector. So you know that what's happened in much of the rest of the world in the last few years has been there's been this great disintermediation of credit. So we just talk about how a, a firm just goes right to the, the bond market or, or right to the stock market to get capital and bypasses big banks. This hasn't happened in Africa. So needless to say, the more integrated the, the uh, African economy is, the worse its effects. So Egypt and Nigeria stand out, where liquid stock markets have taken bigger falls than others. So Egypt has lost, as of January, 61% uh, of its market share by, um, by, by the primary index, and Nigeria has lost 55%, where if, if you compare that to a country like Morocco and then Cote d'Ivoire, you're going, Morocco and Cote d'Ivoire are, are much closer to about 30% of a decline in their market value. Um, the problem that, that firms are experiencing in African countries is obviously access to credit because the marginal rates have gone up since the crisis has begun and sovereign debt spreads are higher. And some of the bank's line of credit, some of the, the, the uh, bank's and subsidiaries' line of credit to their, their um, host country or the, the core country has been cut, forcing African countries to rely more heavily than usual on official sources. So looking forward, the crisis will probably hit most directly the trade relations and financing trade relations, and, and this is compounded by the fact that most of you know that primary commodity prices have declined sharply in the last few uh, months, but also in the last year. So the general recession in the world economy means that all foreign direct investment will likely be cut and migrant remittances will be static. So the key sectors that will be hurt are obviously mining, tourism, textile, and manufacturing. And as a response to this, the, um, the board of directors of the African Development Bank have put four initiatives together, an emergency liquidity facility, a trade finance initiative, a framework for ac accelerated resource transfers from the African Development Fund resources to eligible countries, and an enhanced policy advisory support system. I think most analysts who look at those four initiatives would say the key thing that we should look for is whether or not that emergency liquidity facility will have enough money. So will the additional amounts have to come from the bank or from um, the United States government is, is a question that might come to those of you who work on the Hill. So just to briefly talk about um, how specifically, because I, I said I think that we really need to think about specific countries, the most immediate thing would obviously be to separate off South Africa. Think about South Africa is completely different because South Africa is a market, a, a stock market that has been well integrated in the world economy since the 1800s. The stock market capitalization per capita, if you look at the settler population, was more capitalized by about 1890 than the, than the United States was. So it's a very old and functioning stock market and, and financial market. And obviously, you're all probably aware that South Africa is participating in the G20 process. So what South Africa is going to need going forward is some, is some way to devise strategies that are going to structure its integration to global markets in a way that protects itself in the same way other middle-income countries are going to look for, and also a way to keep demand high, so to have a stimulus program similar to the other middle-income countries, because the world community is looking for middle-income countries to expand their demand in order to bring about the, the, the end of the recession. If you move to countries like Seychelles, the, the crisis in the Seychelles started out more as a debt crisis that was connected to the international crisis, but that was brought on by uh, fuel and food price shocks and the global downturn. So the IMF loan package has involved the typical liberalizing the exchange rate regime and removing exchange restrictions and floating the rupee. But um, here, obviously, the attention of the world community should be focused on the um, more traditional problems that are, uh, that are connected to these these fluctuating food and fuel prices in development uh, studies. So um, these are much more traditional development concerns. Um, the Central African Republic, Central African Republic has had a problem with the financing of its um, of its internal, its, its state bank. So here you would need to address the problems of the, the state bank. Uh, Zambia, Zambia is another great example to pull out because here we have a firm. We have a firm that has struggled with the privatization that has brought on from the copper industry and how that firm is going to function in the global copper market in the future. So um, again, you may or may not be familiar with the, the specifics of the Zambian copper mining industry, but um, the privatization deal that was cut meant that the government received less of a share than it had previously, and in early 2008, the government instituted a, a mining tax increase to try to recoup some of that loss. 
the price right now for copper is one third what it was six months ago. So again, when we think about the, the, the vulnerability of the Zambian economy, we're not maybe talking so much about a financial problem as again, this, this problem of the firm continuing to operate without access to credit in, in, um, in a market where the price of copper fluctuates so dramatically. So maybe the international organizations involved here would more appropriately be the IFC than um, some of the, the, the bank or even bilateral aid. Botswana, um, not surprisingly, um, given Botswana's own history, has not taken as big of a hit. The banks have not been hit as hard. Um, what one of my colleagues in Botswana informed me when I was talking to him prior to this uh, session is that one of the local banks in Botswana has decided to uh, basically ride out the storm with its dependable customers by cutting its loan payments until things can improve. The central bank of Botswana, m by most estimates, has 28 months of foreign exchange to get through and, and will probably make it through until the elections. On the negative side for Botswana, similar to Zambia, there's a problem in the mining industry because the mines are closed for longer periods of time and, and their foreign operations or the, the expansion of their operations has been cut. So just in sum, I think when we look at the continent and we look at the financial crisis, we have to be very careful to maintain ma the aid structure as it exists now because we're talking about a very vulnerable segment of the world's population. But we also have to look specifically to the needs of specific countries rather than trying to think this is the general solution that we need for the whole continent because there, there are no general solutions. And we should obviously support the multilateral development banks in their areas to help specific sectors. But um, looking forward, the, we are pretty much in the same situation of all of us in the, in the world community and trying to figure out how we're going to rebuild a global financial system that insulates certain parts of that from the, the allows all of us to have access to credit and savings that, that will be reasonably secure in, in our lifetimes. And, and and segment off a certain amount for speculative activity, but that is that is a similar problem that I think all of the world community is, is currently addressing. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, that was great. I learned a lot uh, about stock markets that I didn't know. <laughs> um, let me now introduce um, Sudhir Shetty, who is the um, Sector Director of Poverty Reduction and Economic Management in the Africa region of the World Bank, um, where he has been since uh, 2001 in that, in that division? In, in that unit. In that unit, yes. Um, and again, which is focusing on um, the economic growth, uh, more equitable economic growth in the African uh, continent. Thanks very much uh, for that uh, introduction, uh, and, and uh, let me uh, begin by sort of saying that uh, uh, Professor Lavelle uh, sort of stole one of my lines, which was to, which I always use uh, ever since I found a book that I gave my uh, then six-year-old daughter, which was entitled "Africa is not a is not a uh, Africa." is not a continent. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Africa is not a country. And, and I think it makes the point that she made, which is we, we too often, including at the World Bank, tend to sort of paint this uh, varied and diverse continent with, with, a, with a single uh, brush. And, and uh, uh, the other thing that I, that uh, Anne uh, uh, actually uh, uh, also stole from me was the, was the, was the uh, point about growth. I, I, too often, I think, we tend to uh, talk about Africa in terms of human development. And what's most striking to me when I visit the continent and when I speak to African policymakers is that their emphasis is on, is on growth. It's on trying to become, if they're not already, become middle-income countries and to do it within a generation rather than over the space of many generations. Now, that doesn't mean human development isn't important. Of course, human development is important when you look at where Africa stands in terms of human development indicators. But what it also means is that a key focus in Africa has to be how to sustain economic growth. And that's why uh, where I want to start today is not
not by looking at the crisis, but rather by looking at where was Africa before the financial crisis. And this is the point uh, that, that Anne made. And, and, and the, the, the bottom line here, the one thing I want to leave you with here, is there had been actually a significant turning point for much of sub-Saharan Africa since about the late 1990s in terms of economic growth. Now, yes, some of this was linked to the fact that commodity prices were booming, that the world economy was booming, but it was, it was broader than that. There were a significant number of African countries that had made quite significant and, if you speak to those policymakers, quite difficult policy reforms and had sustained them over long enough periods of time that the fruits of those efforts were, were beginning to emerge. So, so wh what we were seeing, for instance, was looking and, and having said that uh, 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 Africa is not a country, I'm now going to uh, fall into that fallacy myself, but being an economist, I fall into this fa fallacy all the time, is I am going to talk about Africa in general. But, 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 but I'll also try to, to convince you that there was that under those averages were, was, uh, was actually, were actually shifts in trends. And, and so, for instance, what one saw since the early 2000s in Africa was per capita income growth rates that were about 3%. These are per capita uh, uh, per year. And as a result, what one also saw, obviously, was some improvement in human development indicators. Uh, the most striking one of the most striking examples of this, for instance, was Ghana, and the, the tremendous progress that Ghana made during the uh, during the, the last decade in terms of income poverty. Now, uh, yes, part of this was because Angola was growing at 15 percent a year because of oil. But when you actually break this out, and when you look at resource-rich countries and you look at them separately compared to resource-poor countries, there was a pattern. This pattern was true across both types of countries. It was true whether a country was landlocked or whether a country was coastal. So there was actually, in, from, in my humble opinion, there was actually what economists like to call a structural break in the data. And, and it was not one year. It wasn't two years. It was a sustained uh, 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 period of time. And what, what underlay this? Well, part of it was that the global economy was booming along. It was probably the best period in terms of not just commodity prices, but also uh, liquidity, access to finance, and the like. But what it also, uh, what also underlay it were things like better economic management. Inflation on average in the continent fell from somewhere around 20% uh, uh, percent to about 10% in a period between from the early 2000s to about 2007. Most countries moved to competitive exchange rates. Institutions were improved. There was improved governance. And most importantly, there were fewer conflicts. Not no conflicts, but fewer conflicts. And all of this then led to this. So around, if, if you go back, if you, if you uh, 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 reverse this to about a year and a half ago, I would say there was cautious optimism about the prospects for many African countries, not just resource-rich countries, as I said before, but a range of countries. And then the crisis came along. Now, the punchline here, the, the bottom line I want to leave you here with is, is the one uh, that uh, Professor Lavelle mentioned, which was Africa is not insulated from the crisis. However, the effects of the crisis in Africa have been different. This is not uh, Eastern Europe. This is not Latin America. This is not East Asia. But that doesn't mean that Africa is insulated from the crisis. And, and I think this is a particularly important message in this building and in this part of Washington, D.C., because obviously the concern, the greatest concern here is with the United States. The greatest concern here is the, uh, with the major trading partners of the United States. But at the same time, I think there also needs to be an understanding that this is a crisis that has already reached many countries in Africa, but it's like a wave. 
It's even if it hasn't reached them, it's creeping towards them. And the longer this crisis continues, the more likely it'll it'll impact those populations. Now, what what do I in in let let me break this part of my presentation into two parts. First, what are the transmission channels, and then second, let me talk briefly about the the impacts. In terms of transmission channels, exports are the obvious one, and there, yes, Africa, much of Africa is still primarily uh, dependent on commodity exports. And that's where you already heard the numbers. It's, it's affected a range of commodities. It's affected uh, the oil prices. It's affected most minerals. The only mineral that's uh, done, uh, the only metal that's done pretty well is gold. And the only uh, uh, other commodity that seems to have survived for reasons that I don't fully understand, although some people say it's related to chocolate being a comfort food, is cocoa. So the only country that has escaped the commodity uh, price uh, uh, downturn is Ghana, which for fortuitously for itself exports both gold and cocoa. Uh, however, <laughs> metal prices have declined about 40% from their peak in 2008. So that's one, one aspect of it. Many other African countries that are not commodity dependent are very dependent on tourism. Seychelles, Mauritius, Cape Verde, Tanzania, Kenya, and they're all obviously seeing big declines in terms of uh, uh, tourism revenues. Uh, so that's on exports. Uh, private capital flows. As, as uh, uh, Professor Lavelle said, Africa had become this destination for uh, uh, new venture capital. It was the new frontier. So by, by 2000, in 2007, uh, capital flows, this, these are not ODA flows. So this was the other difference that had happened over the, over the, uh, in the last decade. Over $50 billion flowed to different African countries. Yes, it was concentrated, but one was also seeing it go into different countries, into newer countries. It wasn't all South Africa. It wasn't all Nigeria. It, was, it wasn't all oil-producing countries. Now that's obviously slowed to barely a trickle. Uh, Ghana and Kenya, for instance, both had plans to uh, offer bonds, sovereign bonds, which they've uh, postponed. Uh, the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo has uh, seen its FDI uh, projections decline by close to $2 billion. So that's the second uh, transmission channel. Remittances. Uh, the numbers here are very dodgy, but our best estimates of this was that this had peaked at about $20 billion in uh, 2007. Where are the sources of remittances to Africa? Europe and the US. So obviously, big declines. You're seeing this in the data in Kenya. You're seeing this most strikingly in the data in Lesotho, which gets a lot of its remitt remittances, obviously, from South Africa. Foreign aid, the other channel. There's been no effect yet, but I emphasize the yet. Uh, and this is again one of the play, one of the reasons this building and this area, this part of Washington is particularly relevant. Uh, you've, the U.S. has committed a large sum of money to the International Development Association as well as to the soft uh, lending arm of the African Development Bank, the African Development Fund. But the way that th those are commitments. Uh, I, I, I don't know enough about how Congress works, but I know the word appropriations. And, and, and I understand that this has to be appropriated every year. So there is a real likelihood, if this crisis continues, that one is going to see foreign aid, not just in the US, but in, in Western Europe as well, decline. So these are all the transmission channels. What are their effects on different things that matter for Africa? Growth? Well, the growth projections continue to ratchet downwards. The, we have a joke uh, down where I work in, uh, uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue that uh, we have a little contest between the IMF and ourselves as to who's going to lower their next growth rate more. Uh, because that's been, the, that's been the tendency. So for instance, in November 08, we projected growth for Sub-Saharan Africa in 2009 at, at about 4.2 percent. Our current growth rate for Africa in, two, in 2009 for the co continent is likely to be close, closer to 2.5 percent. And I bet the next IMF estimate will, 
lop off another percentage point. Specific countries, South Africa. Uh, in November 08, we anticipated growth in 2009 to be over 2%. They'll be lucky if they get 1% growth in 2009. Nigeria, we were projecting close to 6%. They'll be lucky if they get to 3%. Uh, Kenya, uh, we were projecting 3%. It'll probably be closer to 2 or 2.5%. Two and, and this is 2009. And right now, all these projections are assuming uh, a, a downturn that basically just lasts into 2009, and then the world economy picks up. So that's growth. The, fis the, the second most important thing, obviously, is on the fiscal side. Huge impact for oil producers. That's where most of their fiscal revenues come from. Nigeria, Gabon, Angola, Sudan. Uh, uh, and then if it's not oil, it's other minerals. Zambia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Overall, we are, we, uh, between ourselves and the fund, we think that the continent's going from about a 2% uh, of GDP fiscal surplus to about a 4.5% deficit. A lot of that is obviously oil producers, but even among non-oil producers, you're looking at a quite substantial deterioration of about 1.5 to 2% of GDP. Same, same sort of thing, obviously, on the external balances. You're seeing uh, a huge decline, uh, a, a huge expansion of current account deficits across uh, uh, the continent. Now, what does all of this add up to? Well, this is where Africa is most vulnerable, because despite those five or six years of sustained economic growth in many countries, countries across the continent. Much of the population, even in those countries, lives barely above the dollar a day poverty line. So first you had the food and fuel, uh, oil sh uh, the, the food and oil shocks of, of early 2008, late 2007 and early 2008, which probably pushed a lot of those people below the poverty line. On top of that, now you're having growth rates decline by between two to three percentage points, which is obviously going to have a huge impact as well. And with that, obviously, it, that is just uh, an, an impact on growth, which then translates into incomes. But then you have huge impacts in terms of human development, in terms of infant mortality, in terms of child mortality, in terms of uh, 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 kids staying in school, uh, in primary school, and the like. So finally, very quickly, how do we deal with it? Well. I think uh, Professor Lavelle already made the point. It obviously needs to be tailored to country circumstances. South Africa has options that Guinea-Bissau and the Central African Republic don't. Uh, and, and second, these options are not going to be the same as Western Europe and, and, and the US. I think spending too long on discussing whether a fiscal stimulus is appropriate for Africa is quite frankly, in my humble opinion, a waste of time. It is not the right question for countries that are as fiscally strapped as these countries. The right question, if, uh, the, the right question in my mind is about where the money is going to come from to, to keep these countries' uh, uh, budgets and finances in balance. The second thing I would say is it's very important, I think, that the past, that whatever the global community does, that the past reforms not be reversed. They were producing results. They were producing results in terms of growth. They were producing results in terms of human development. And it's very important that when this crisis ends, that Africa is poised to continue on a growth path that it had started on before this crisis. And, and, I, and I would argue the bank's uh, efforts recognize each of these priorities. So, so let me quickly turn then to what is the bank doing? First, uh, the, the uh, IBRD part of the bank, this is the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. This is the part that doesn't depend on the appropriations that, uh, that occur in this part of Washington, DC. This is money we, we, we borrow from the markets and lend to creditworthy countries, such as South Africa, such as Botswana. Uh, we, are, we are raising the amount of IBRD we make available. That includes Africa. Obviously, much of that new IBRD money isn't flowing to Africa. It's going to Europe. It's going to Eastern Europe. It's going to Latin America. But we are uh, stepping up our IBRD lending, for instance, to Mauritius. We are looking at options for stepping it up to South Africa and, uh, and Botswana. But the most important part for Africa is on IDA, the soft money we, we uh, uh, give.
give out based on uh, contributions from the US and other rich countries. And here, the good news is we're well endowed. We had a very successful replenishment. This is replenished every three years. We had a very successful replenishment of what we call IDA 15, which was the 15th replenishment of IDA, of about, to the tune of about $42 billion last year. So we have about half of that will flow to Africa over a three-year period from uh, our, uh, which, is, uh, which started last June and will go to uh, June of uh, uh, 2011. Uh, and, and what we've started doing with this is recognizing the, the, seri the seriousness of the crisis. We are front-loading it. We are recognizing that the pot is, is, is not going to probably be topped up, but we are hoping that all of the countries that have committed that, including the United States, will make good on their pledges. And we are front-loading it to say that if, if Zambia needs more of that money in 2009, we'll make it available in 2009 rather than waiting until 2011. Uh, second, uh, we've, uh, uh, President Zelik working with other uh, uh, multilaterals and other global leaders has come up with the idea of the vulnerability financing facility. This recognizes that there may be a need for additional money in these countries, and that that money should go specifically towards trying to prevent the already poor people from falling below the poverty line. So it's aimed at things like safety nets, it's aimed at things like public uh, works programs, it's aimed at things like uh, primary education. Uh, IFC, which is the International Finance Corporation, which is our private sector arm, has come up with an infrastructure crisis facility as well as a trade fin a trade financing facility. Obviously, some of that will go to Africa. And finally, but, but not the least important, I think, is on the knowledge side, which is I, we've, we're trying very hard to ensure that the momentum for reform isn't slowed in Africa once this crisis ends. And that is, yes, there is a lot of public ownership of banks that's occurring in the, in, in, in the US and Western Europe. But perhaps that's not the right thing for Africa to do. Perhaps some of the privatization of banks, some of the uh, expansion of stock exchanges that we heard about before was in fact the right thing. And this is where I think it comes back to the need to customize the policy advice to the circumstances of particular countries. And finally, on the knowledge agenda, we are trying very hard to push back against the tide of protectionism that's already showing, uh, showing up in, in Western Europe and in, and in the US. Because if there's, if there's one thing that'll set back Africa in the longer term, it'll be if, there are, if, they, if it's impossible for them to get into markets which are essential for them to, to get into over the longer term uh, in order to grow sustainably. Let me stop there, and I apologize if I went a bit over. We'll open it up for questions, and if I can have questions from uh, congressional staff first, and if they're. Can you guys just take the, the microphones and just yeah. let, um, know what they okay. And, okay. Any congressional folks? Okay, can the others of you? Oh, okay, back there in the green shirts. Good afternoon, Robert Dougie, Afton Voice of America. This question is really for either of the panelists. Um, Dr. Shetty, you cited the Democratic Republic of Congo as one of the countries affected by the decline in commodity prices in minerals in particular. I think you gave the number 40% across the board. Um, do you have some, perhaps some more detailed information about the impact? It's really for either of the panelists, but uh, detailed information on the impact of the decline in commodity prices in the Great Lakes region generally. I think the question is especially relevant given the degree of official and unofficial or unofficial economic integration between, for example, the regions of North and South Kivu on the one hand and Rwanda on the other. Uh, I'm thinking also of the recent comment by President Sarkozy of France in which he was, in fact, uh, mentioned 
mentioning the possibility of even greater cooperation between these countries and these regions as a means of you know, alleviating the conflicts over there. And finally, given the fact that, of course, there is such a wide, uh, I say, um, you know, patterns of trade between the Great Lakes region on the one hand and Eastern Africa on the other with Tanzania and Kenya. Perhaps you have some more detailed information about how the decline in commodity prices has affected those regions, generally speaking. Let's take a couple of questions um, together. Um, yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Nia Kwete. I work with the African immigrant community. Um, I have a two-part question, one for um, Professor Lavelle. Um, you mentioned how Egypt, uh, as an example of those countries more embedded in the global system, how they suffered more. So my basic question is, is it then still a good idea to embed African countries more and more into the global system and in fact, I noticed that during the um, campaign, the little platform we got from the president's uh, uh, group was that their goal was to embed Africa more. And we think that is something to be debated. Now for Dr. Shetty, um, the idea that the previous reforms in Africa, which came after a lot of debates and fights and contention and IMF riots, that they should not be questioned but sh should be continued, frankly troubles me because part of the debate here we've seen is that the idea that governments have no role is being questioned here. The idea that businesses um, must deregulation is the way to go, and even the idea that greed is good. These are things that Africans rebelled against for years and because they needed the bank and the fund, the, the governments kept quiet, not the people. So now if we are questioning those here, I'm very troubled by the contention that those things should not be debated. I think in the interest of simply democracy, we should debate what the, policy, what the right policy is. Okay, why don't we take those two. Uh, Dr. Lavelle, do you wanna? Thank you for the question. I, I think that's a great question of, of whether or not uh, Africa should be more or less embedded in the world economy. And um, there's, I think there's an awful lot of strong arguments for why it should not be rushed in, in the way that some, perhaps some other countries were. But I think that rather than looking at it at as a yes or a no, what would be more uh, important to think about is how is Africa going to be embedded into the world economy? And one thing that really strikes me about financial markets, and, and here I'm going to speak up for some of the financial so-called innovation that occurred in the United States. There are financial innovations that could be very useful for bringing developing countries, but specifically countries that don't have um, well-integrated structure, uh, domestic financial structures in. And there are types of um, regulations and restrictions that could be put into how financial instruments are packaged so that, the, so that African countries could tap global markets without all capital having to be channeled through the state, and yet at the same time, um, individual African firms and, and individuals would have better access to credit to finance things like houses and firms and, and whatnot. And, and here I'll point out that the World Bank did great work on this in the, in the 1990s through the International Finance Corporation, in, in my opinion, when they, when they developed the emerging markets, um, the, the funds, where, where they went in and allowed a, a degree of government participation, a degree of private participation, and then listed closed-end mutual funds, which are no longer very, um, well, they became very unpopular popular in the investment community because American and, and European investors preferred open market uh, f uh, mutual funds. But there are actually ways that financial instruments could be structured to channel money into d individual countries and, and to the firm level without suffering the kind of vagaries of, of some of the, the international flows that we've seen. And the other obviously contentious issue would be reallowing re capital uh, controls. So we saw this debate reemerge after the, the 97 crisis. Um, um, the fact that Africa is not integrated, I don't think has been a positive thing for African growth by anyone's um, estimation. But um, I think that the possibility of integration with the uh, with um, the possibility for capital controls um, is, is something that is is very important to be considered. Uh, 
First, on, on the question about the DRC and the Great Lakes region, I, I don't have sort of the kind of detail you, you're looking for, but I'm happy to get it to you if, if uh, you're interested. But let me just make a more general point, which is, in a, in a perverse way, I think, this period of lower commodity prices may actually give resource-rich countries an opportunity that was not present in the last four or five years. Uh, and and, and, and the, the rationale is the following. I mean, we know that a lot of the conflict in the Great Lakes region is around control of valuable resources. Those resources are much more valuable in the ground right now. Than, and this is exactly what one is seeing in Botswana, for instance. I mean, uh, you know, I tend to believe that the, the De Beers ad is right. Diamonds are forever. But, uh, and I think the Botswanans believe that too. So they believe that they're better off leaving those diamonds in the ground for now while diamond prices are crashing because at some point the crisis will be over and, and uh, the world will go back to demanding diamonds. I think it's the same with copper. It's the same with cobalt. Uh, so, so I think uh, in the Great Lakes, I think there's an opportunity to try to address some of the issues that underlie the conflict uh, at a time when the, 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 the resource, uh, resources themselves aren't driving it as much. And, and I think more generally for resource-rich countries, this is an opportunity for them to say, have we been managing these resources well? And I think the answer in most of Africa is clear. Other than Botswana, there isn't a single example of an African country that has managed its resource, its natural resources well. Now that's true across the world. There's also Papua New Guinea. There's also uh, Mongolia. So it's not as though it's an African issue, but it's, an, it's why it's called the resource curse. So, so that would be sort of my general answer. Uh, going back to your question, it's an excellent question, and I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that we don't debate the, the policy prescriptions. In fact, I would argue, and I was in the World Bank in the 1990s, and I would argue we got a lot of things wrong, including in Africa. However, I would also argue that, and I would urge you to go and look at the numbers, and to look at what reform has done in many African countries. Now, I think there's still a question of what kind of reforms are important, what they're phasing is. The World Bank uh, sponsored over the last couple of years something called the Growth Commission, which was a commission of very uh, well-known practitioners, academics, who looked at the issue of what do we know about growth? And frankly, the answer they came to was it all depends. And these were not all economists, so you can't blame them for, for uh, coming to that conclusion because of their training. Uh, so uh, they were policy makers. They were people, uh, a lot of them were policy makers. And one, but one of the things they said was that some things are very important. You cannot grow unless the macroeconomy is stable. I think we know that from Africa across, I mean, we don't need more examples of that. We can see it in Nigeria, we can see it uh, in, in, uh, in the democratic, in, in what was then Zaire, we can see it across the board. So, so the, the, the debate is over how one achieves that. And, you know, for instance, this issue of capital controls. I mean, what is the role for capital controls? I think the, the, the jury is out on that. All I'm suggesting is we should continue to have a discussion of that. And, and what the bank is doing is not saying to countries, here, take our money if you do the following five things. But we are saying it's important that the goals of macro stability, of a competitive exchange rate, of greater integration with the world economy. I, I agree with Professor Lavelle. I don't think anyone can say that an entire continent having a, sh a share of world trade of 2%, which has fallen continuously since 1948, is a good thing. Africa is a quarter less integrated with the global economy today than it was uh, uh, 30 years ago. That cannot possibly, and that's including petroleum and including minerals. So, so that's an extent to which, the extent to which Africa is marginalized from the global economy. So, so that would be my, my response. If, if I can make a, a quick response that I think addresses a little bit of both of these questions too. When we talk about integration, we are usually sort of in our biases thinking about integration with 
the develop with Europe and with the rest of the sort of developed world. And I think Africa has a real, African countries have a real need to deepen their economic integration with each other. If I'm not mistaken, the share of trade within Africa is also quite low and quite below what people think it could be if the rules and the tariff structures and whatever were were more integrated and to the point back here and the infrastructure was more more integrated so that the landlocked countries could actually reach reach ports. Um, so I, I just want to put in a pitch for the regional integration aspect of this. Um, another question. Yeah, back. Uh, Sam Rosemarin with the uh, Subcommittee on Africa and Global Health. Uh, I guess my question is piggybacking off that, that last comment and wanted to know about uh, the regional development communities, uh, SADC and, and the like, and how you think the sort of the keystone countries, let's say uh, Kenya and, and East Africa, Nigeria, West Africa, South Africa, you know, South Africa and the Southern Africa, how, how those, the, the decline of those economies might impact the, the greater region. And if also you could uh, speak a little bit about uh, some of your concerns maybe about uh, the, the currency exchange rates and, and how the currencies are doing in these countries and if, if that's gonna a major cause for concern. Thank you. Let's take another question over here, the um, woman in the purple. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Courtney Vaughan, and my question is for World Bank. Um, if we could go back in time 10 years from now, so in retrospect, if you were advising a country like Nigeria in terms of um, what sort of mit um, risk mitigation strategies you would consider more so on the reinvestment side, right? Considering that we have had a commodity boom, a lot of money came into Nigeria, and also looking at how the, the approach to privatization of state-owned enterprises in Nigeria, how that was implemented, and the financial institutions recapitalization approach in terms of going to the stock exchange to bring in money, and your top line is showing a lot of growth, but when one one looks at the underlying performances, they were not there. Okay. okay one, we'll take one more behind the woman in the green. Sudhami, when I work for Manchester Trade, I think I have a very general question. Um, uh, my question would be, you had um, said that how much money the World Bank would be investing in Africa in the next three years. What kind of projects or what kind of, uh, in which places and what are you trying to develop there? Because most of the talk I have heard, at least in the aid community, is that the aid is being channeled, it is well intentioned, but the results are not as obvious unless it is very focused on some particular sector. So is it to improve trade? Is it for infrastructure? Is it for education? What are you focusing on? Thank you. Okay. I can comment a little bit about the, the regional element because at least with financial markets, it matters a lot. And, and when I was doing my work on, on the West African Stock Exchange, the level of integration was quite higher um, for the accounting standards because they had made that effort when they developed the stock exchange to systematize the, the accounting standards, which if you know the current financial crisis, part of the problem that we have is, is that we have accounting standards in the United States that aren't shared in Europe and there has been a gradual coming together of, of the, the two standards, but that, that process hasn't been completed and it costs American firms and, or foreign firms an awful lot of money to convert their, their books to, to American standards and list in New York. So anyway, um, they had actually been doing better regional work in Africa. That was another example of a place where um, people frequently d don't think of this, that we, we would learn from the African example that that was a better way to go about constructing a regional market. And um, and for a while in the, in the academic world, and, and you would certainly know more about this than I would, um, that there, were, there, were, there was talk of developing regionally based aid that, that countries would be rewarded if they cooperated with each other and that, that seemed like a very sensible uh, route to, to myself at least to going down. Briefly, someone asked about the currency and, the, and the, I think one of the more significant factors that I haven't seen in any of the news literature is the effect of the strong dollar on, on African currencies and um, so I, I actually did check that when I looked at the, the market indexes to see if they had adjusted 
adjusted that. Because remember, any foreign market, any developing country market in particular, but any foreign stock market is has to do with the value of the shares, but it also has to do with the currency. So it's a it's a double risk that, that is taken on by the foreign investor when they invest in another in another market. And I hadn't seen anything specifically addressing the strong dollar and whether or not that had influenced those indices. So um, I gave you uh, statistical information, and I, I was hoping no one would ask me, but I'm pointing out to you if you're interested in this, you, you would probably want to check that out. Remember that in um, Africa you have a, a currency block, and that currency block in, in uh, the francophone zone is pegged to the uh, euro now and handled through the French treasury, through the unique uh, post-colonial relationship that those countries have with France. So you would have to um, consider that in any, any of your discussions of or your considerations of the currency crises in Africa. If you want to think of it as a crisis, I don't know. Then with respect to the financial crisis, it would be linked to the euro. Just uh, very quickly, just on the regional impacts, uh, uh, you're right. I mean, each of these countries is going to ha all have a huge impact on their neighbors. I think you already, you've already seen that most starkly, I think, in southern Africa uh, in terms of the slowdown of the South African economy. And, and they're obviously much cl more closely knit, uh, connected to, to the rest of uh, the customs union, uh, Botswana, Namibia, Lesotho, and Swaziland, uh, than to the wider SADC, but clearly, I mean, I think the Mozambicans are already concerned, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, and you're going to see that in Nigeria. Uh, Kenya, probably a bit less, because I think the connections, I mean, it's not that much of a powerhouse, but certainly Nigeria and West Africa. On the currencies, just going back to a point that Professor Lavelle made, you, yes, the CFA franc is connected to the euro, but the good news there is that because the euro has weakened against the dollar, you actually have these currencies depreciating, which may be a good thing because there was a fairly long period of appreciation, uh, which was hurting their, uh, their exports uh, over the last two or three years. Uh, but more generally, yes, I mean, to the extent that there's, there's uh, uh, significant stresses on the external account, uh, a lot of these currencies are under pressure. I mean, the Zambian uh, uh, quacha is, is, is one example. The, the rand has depreciated quite a lot. Uh, but again, I mean, going back to the previous question about, you know, what policies are good, I mean, yes, there is pain associated with a flexible exchange rate, uh, but it's not clear, at least to me, that uh, pegging the exchange rate and then allowing an, a parallel market to, to, to emerge, which is by also happening in a, in a number of countries. I mean, Nigeria has, for all practical purposes, now pegged its rate, and so there is beginning to be a, a, a parallel market premium open opening up vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Naira, which is already, I think, of the order of about 15 percent. Uh, uh, you're seeing that in Malawi. You're seeing that in a couple of other countries. And, and sure, th I think that is a, that is a real, real risk. Um, uh, fine, on Nigeria, I, I, I don't want to sort of uh, go back, and uh, partly because I just don't know enough about the specifics of the Nigerian program. But let me tell you a couple of things I think they did right. Uh, one is, I think, uh, uh, they, uh, the, the kind of financial sector reforms they pursued, I think, were very far-reaching. They did achieve results. I mean, the Nigerian financial sector is, has emerged, I think, much stronger than it was. I think the one issue there is one of supervision. And, 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 and that, I know, is something that the Central Bank of Nigeria is still, uh, trying, is still worried about. The second thing I think they did right is they compared to, if you look at Nigeria during the last oil boom versus previous oil booms, I think, you know, on a grade of, on a, on a scale of uh, 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 zero to 100, I think they would get probably very high marks compared to what happened in earlier oil booms because they did actually save a substantial amount of the oil revenues. And that's one of the reasons why they're not in as deep trouble today. And for that matter, neither is Angola. Uh, many of the oil, oil producing countries managed this boom much better than they did previous booms. The one exception to that was Sudan 
where I think they anticipated that oil prices would remain at $130 from now until infinity, which obviously proved to be a, a bad uh, assumption. But but I think, I, I mean, now, now I think what, what happened even in Nigeria and Gabon and places like that is I think they, like everyone else, was were, were surprised by the rapidity with which oil prices unwound. And, and, but nevertheless, they, they, d they did save a substantial amount of those, of those revenues. I mean, but, but, but obviously there are deeper problems in Nigeria about how this money is actually then used. In the, and, and that, I think, is a, is a much longer, t much longer term issue that has to be dealt with uh, by the Nigerian government. Uh, finally, in terms of World Bank lending, um, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but it all depends, uh, because it does depend on the types of countries. So the kind of program we would have in uh, uh, Mauritius would be very different than the kind of program we would have in the Central African Republic or in, uh, in Guinea-Bissau. But having said that, I, given the crisis, obviously one of the things we are trying to do is to make sure that a lot of, more of this money would be provided in the form of support to the budget so that countries, when they take hits in, on the revenue uh, side, uh, they're able to maintain expenditures that are essential. Now, does all aid money uh, go to good purposes? Well, we could be here, I think, until the same time uh, next year debating that question. And uh, you know, Bill Easterly, if he's around, will probably come and, and have much to say on that. So I'm not going to get into that. I, I think it's, it's a very difficult question. I would, in, again, in my opinion for what it's worth, I would say that uh, uh, I think Bill is too extreme in his dismissal of uh, all aid as being wasted. Uh, but I would argue others who say that all aid is used well are also uh, equally uh, uh, misleading in their conclusion. The answer, as always, is somewhere in between. I don't believe that the only good form of aid is aid that's targeted to particular purposes. I think there's a, there is actually a huge advantage to governments in allowing them the the, 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 to make decisions about how, their, how money they get from overseas is used, but obviously it depends on their capacity to use it, and that's one of the struggles we face in, in uh, making these decisions. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Right in the front. I think this is yeah. the last question. So. Uh, Chachin, freelance correspondent. And uh, Anne, you say last uh, five years, uh, lots of agricultural growth in Africa. But on, then you also say there's a, a food crisis. Uh, what's the problem? And I will go one thing further. How to make uh, uh, agricultural growth there uh, sustainable? And uh, uh, I think the price or commodity, uh, commodity now is set uh, either in London or Chicago. I think this is uh, very unfair to African and Latin American. How could this uh, be changed? And also make uh, the com commodity price uh, is, uh, is uh, reasonable. Uh, and uh, you talk about uh, uh, raise the money. Where do you raise the money from? And also, w when we talk about this uh, uh, stupid uh, economy, I think our mentality should be changed. In Africa, we should talk about the developing economy. Thank you. I'm, when I was talking about growth, I was talking about overall economic growth, not, not agricultural growth in these countries. I think agriculture in, again, speaking very broadly, has, has not um, done particularly well overall in the, in the food crops. I think there are exceptions in some of the crops like cocoa that was mentioned um, that have done well. I think one of the challenges in Africa has been that um, farmers don't have access to the best technology technology, and they don't have the kinds of investments in, in roads and irrigation systems that they need to be more productive. And when you talk about, you know, how do you make prices, quote, more reasonable, one of the reasons prices, um, food prices get to be high in Africa is, is one, is because yield 
yields are quite low. Um, and the other is because there's a lot of, of waste in the system that people are paying for very inefficient transportation. They're paying for systems where the, the waste um, in, in food systems is, can be around 60% that of the crop that's, that spoils because there's not proper storage and not proper transport. So there's, there's a lot of ways to sort of reduce the prices that consumers are paying and at the same time increase the returns to farmers if we can make the right investments in terms of improving improving the systems that that people are facing in Africa. And of course the crisis was, you know, the, that there was a global uh, confluence of factors, the, the biofuels policies in uh, the United States and Europe, the uh, speculative markets, there were droughts, uh, and then there was a, a seven or eight year long decline in global stocks that all came together last last fall to um, to sharply increase food prices. Um, and while that has mitigated somewhat now, uh, prices are still higher, global prices are still higher than they've been for a long time, and the projections are that um, they'll continue to be um, higher for quite some time until we get uh, get more production, more productivity. So I don't know if anybody wants to take the question about commodity. Uh, yeah, Next well, I, I, my personal view is that I don't think there's much mileage in trying to uh, influence the way these prices are set. I, I, I think I have a pretty good sense of why commodity prices went south as quickly as they did. I think it was related to world demand. I think it's pretty clear that uh, as, the, as the world got into recession, things uh, collapse. I, now, what I don't understand is fully is why the amplitude in oil prices is what it is. But I. Right, but and and that's well, but that's why. Well, we can we can you know, but w the world is unfair. I mean, that's my sort of you know. Unfortunately, <laughs> the world is an unfair place, and we we've got to figure out how to make it work better. But but I'm not sure that concentrating our energies on trying to influence the way commodity markets work is necessarily the the way to go. But let me just take. Uh, I think it would be more productive, quite frankly, for commodity-rich African countries to be asking the question, why could they not be more like Botswana or Malaysia? I think that, to me, as an economist, is a policy question that is worth thinking about, because I think it has to do with governance, it has to do with economic decisions that, that, that can actually be made at a national level, and, and uh, I think there are lessons here. I think, uh, you know, and, and Botswana 30 or 40 years ago was not that different from where many African countries are today. It wasn't a rich or a middle-income country. Malaysia wasn't that, that different. And, and so I think, I think that, to, to my mind, would be, uh, uh, you know, so what? But the, the only thing I would add to that is remember that all commodities are not the same. And we learned a lot from those old commodity buffer stock debates in the 1970s. Putting cocoa in a shed is not the same thing as putting oil in a shed. And, and I agree with what you're saying about Botswana, but it's an awful lot easier to continue to mine diamonds and stockpile them, or at least have that debate, than it is to talk about um, something else that, that you're selling. And unfortunately, for uh, African countries, given the climate and all, that most of the African commodities are not easily stored and are not as easily, b b um, so, so that's why a lot of those debates um, came, came to no, no good end, because you couldn't talk about all primary commodities in this. Certainly bananas, my favorite primary commodity. <laughs> <laughs> are not storageable. So over a long period of time. So there really isn't any, I mean, there isn't one common solution, even if you were to want to intervene in those markets, would be my two cents. Okay, I'd like to thank our speakers, and thank you all for coming, and thank the Wilson Center on the Hill for organizing. So. Thank you.